Hey aviators, welcome back to my channel. For those who are new, I'm Ty Jones, your air nerd who brings you honest experiences, reviews, training tips that'll help you aviate, navigate, and communicate. You probably should, guys probably should know that by now. But anyway, welcome back. I'm gonna do something a little bit different this time. This time I'm actually gonna be starting to interview pilots that are being interviewed by the airlines or hired by the airlines and just show you and just bring you that experiences that they've that they have experienced um, the advice that they can actually give you because there's so much valuable information that these guys have to bring forward um, to you so my very first interviewee is Jack he has been a instructor for many years he has thousands of hours of, uh, of, of flight instruction. He has so much valuable information to share with all of you. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the interview. Here's Jack, um, hired by the airlines. Um, how's it going, man? All good, all good. Just uh, looking forward to getting back to flying. Sweet, sweet, man. All right, well, first off, um, I'll start off with the first question. So I got a series of questions here. Um, so the starting out, let's go ahead and start with uh, one of the benefits of uh, being an instructor and what have you gained from being a flight instructor from this time? So knowledge, knowledge, and knowledge. Um, I'd say the benefits of working as a flight instructor uh, at some point in your aviation career is you gain a lot of versatility. Um, primary flight instruction, so what you do in the beginning is much broader than what you're going to do when you start specifying in, in for you know your airline job or your air carrier job. So one day you might train somebody whose goal is to go to the airlines, but the next day it might be somebody who wants to do a 135 corporate uh, gig or uh, even stay in general aviation. So you have to be um, prepared and versed in all aspects of general aviation. So that would be your main perk um, and also you're always on the bleeding edge of what's happening because you're always looking out to stay proficient on your knowledge so whenever something changes with the um, regulations or uh, uh, any new FAA document comes out you immediately um, go and research it and are you know proficient enough to have to be proficient enough to teach it. Mm. Regulations do change all the time, you know, and obviously we got our ADs we got to keep up with and, and all that other good stuff. So, um, oh, yeah. and also uh, another thing is you become really good about researching things yourself. Mm -hmm. because I can see behind you, you've got three far aims over there. Yeah, those are like uh, those are like your uh, uh, entry level regulations mm -hmm. because then um, you got to go and look at all your airworthiness directives. Mm -hmm. uh, Depending on the aircraft that you fly, you might want to become, um, you know, you might want to go and look at your type of data sheet mm -hmm. information. Um, letters of interpretation, let's not even get into those. There is apparently five different interpretations for right. across the country. Right, right, right. I, I've actually uh, contacted the FAA a, a couple of times too, especially like the cross country, you know, what can, what classifies as a cross country, you know, and it says, uh, uh, a, a point of a landing and I actually contacted them about this like what is a point of a landing don't you mean a landing point to a landing point and so that was kind of mixed up or whatever uh, I actually shot a video about that too uh, also uh, but you also did mention a good point about keeping keeping up to date um, and keeping the student students up to date and you mentioned the far ends what I really, what I usually like to do is uh, show them the suggested study list you know oh yeah um, that's a very basic thing to start from I mean would you would you agree Absolutely. And the other thing is, um, I was fortunate enough to become an examiner, a Czech airman. Nice. Uh, and one of the things I noticed is, uh, especially with the regulatory part, which can be sometimes daunting and, you know, boring to some extent, but uh, is nonetheless important how you keep your license, is don't only rely on your mnemonics, because you're going to get the instructor, sorry, the student, mm -hmm. uh, or the examiner in my case, which will say, you know, we'll ask you a basic question and you'll rifle off uh, an acronym or something that you memorize and say, great, can you show me where it says that? Yeah. <laughs> and you get a stare and it's uh, like, well, you know, you got to tell me where your references are. So whenever you go through flight, flight training, make sure that your first question to your instructor when you learn something new is, where do I find this? 
Yeah, and then go and good. read it. Don't only rely on your mnemonics. There it is. There it is. Okay. Uh, well, the other question I want to get into is uh, everybody knows that aviation is very, very expensive. Um, the flight training is definitely not cheap. Um, so you say so you go through the flight training and you finally an instructor. How does the pay actually work? Um, not specifically get into the numbers, but does it really pay for cost of living? Is it really comfortable? So depending on uh, the volume of students that your school you go to teaches that, um, it can, you know, it's, it's enough to, to live, but, you know, the only way you're going to become a millionaire in aviation is if you start as a billionaire. Um, <laughs> the way it works is you're basically paid for your time with the student, meaning that once you get in the airplane, you're paid off what's called the hops. Um, if anybody's ever driven a tractor, the hours in the airplane take over uh, as instead of having, like, mileage on your car. So whenever your engine starts, that timer starts ticking, and you're paid based on how much uh, time spent in the airplane from when the engine starts until it shuts down. And then for the ground lessons is however much time you spend with the students. Um, you know, this can mean sometimes with weather and stuff like that that you'll be in school for, you know, I've done 12, 13, 14 hour days, but only gotten four hours of uh, actual work. Um, but then again, you know, it's it's all part of the of the process. Um, I mean, without getting into the numbers, if I were to look at it from a um, what do you call it, uh, a net uh, right. gain, right? Uh, after about two two and a half years as a flight instructor, uh, I've made back the cost of my instruction without cost. Uh, considering you know cost of living and and uh, all that stuff. Okay. But definitely it'll um it, you're not you're not gonna be uh, driving sports cars and uh, yeah. living in fancy homes, especially in Florida, with uh, <laughs> All right, all right. Well, you you mentioned the um that it depends on um you know uh the time that you're with your students, whether if it's in the ground or the air. Um, so obviously, there's got to be some kind of scheduling process with that. So how does the scheduling work? So as far as the scheduling goes, it really depends on your school. For example, where I worked, um, I, I was a flight instructor. Uh, I probably said this already, but I was a flight instructor for almost three years. Um, and where I used to work, uh, you would uh, basically give, uh, be assigned uh, students. And then you would schedule them on um, on your um, uh, we call it ETA on your web uh, page that has all your uh, your schedule for the day. Now, depending on the number of students and uh, depending on uh, also where the students came from, because uh, we had a lot of internationals who require a certain amount of uh, scheduling in order to meet their immigration requirements. Uh, you might do one or two activities a day with the same person, or if you have a very high low school, you might have you know one activity with each person um, every day, but it'll be enough to fill your whole day. Okay. Um, later on, uh, because of you know certain wor world events and everything, the volume kind of shrunk down, so the scheduling was. Uh, uh, assigned to a uh, scheduling department. So very airline-ish, you know, you'd, uh, you'd check your, um, your schedule uh, in the evening and see, okay, great, tomorrow I have this, this, and this with X, Y, and Z person, and uh, much more so for examiners because you, you would wait for your other fellow instructors to submit their students for uh, uh, exams which in aviation are called check rights. And um, they would get assigned to you, and you'd see. All right, great. Tomorrow, you know, I have this uh, uh, stage private, or this one for uh, instrument, and so on. And then you start preparing. Uh, okay. Okay. In these stages, you're referring to this is a 141 uh, score, right? Is not the most per most particularly toward uh, 61 students. So what? Uh, yeah, basically, a 141 is a full time student. The course is broken up into small uh, smaller chunks um, and it generally uh, gets lower hour requirements to meet 
each, uh, each license. Um, and depending on the school, they might have some privileges of, uh, where they can do in-house testing for these. Uh, otherwise, you would be what's called a Part 61, where you go buy the book on, uh, on the FARAIN, and your exams are always with a uh, what's called a DPE, a Designated Pilot Examiner, from the uh, FAA office, the local FAA office. Um, even with 61, it depends on the school, but even 61, uh, guys, you'd have to do what is called an eval, so they would bring in uh, stage checkers mm -hmm. uh, or check airmen uh, to do the evaluation with you. Um, the only other difference between a stage checker and a check airman is, as a stage checker, you only do those intermediate exams in a 141. As a check airman, uh, I'm actually the person that gives you your license on those in-house exams. Nice, nice, nice. Wow, so you came from all the way from a student pilot all the way to check in and now you're heading to the airline. So tell me, what is the what is the process like? Do they email you? Do they give you a call? Like, how, how did that whole process go? So the best I can really uh, compare it to, it's, it's almost um, like in the services, right? They want to make sure you want to be there. So you're the one reaching out to them. Now, there's a, there's a whole bunch of websites that can help you with that um, without naming them where you'll, you'll put the, uh, your experience and all your qualifications. And then for a fee, um, they will submit it to the airlines. And then you would uh, update your hours mm -hmm. every month and uh, they would keep sending it out. Now, I mean, if you look at 2019, your waiting time for an airline slot was probably 15 minutes. You know, put a mirror <laughs> under your nose. Yeah, you're hired. Uh, yeah. Obviously not. But um, then, obviously, last year, uh, there was a complete stop. Yeah. And now it's uh, it's starting to pick up very quickly. So my process uh, was, well, first of all, uh, I used the uh, downside of in aviation to just make myself as much of a um, uh, hireable candidate as possible. Mm -hmm. So I used the extra free time, if you can call it that. Uh, flight instructors don't get a lot of free time. <laughs> uh, but I used the extra free time to get new ratings and went off and got my ATP CPT, which usually uh, the airlines uh, uh, will sponsor you for. Um, I got my multi-engine instructor rating. I was about to go and do an aerobatics rating nice. and a seaplane rating, but um, due to budgetary constraints, I had to pick one or the other, and I ended up going with the ATP CPT, and then uh, basically put myself into a position where I was going to be in the first set of people that would get called once the hiring process starts. Nice. Um, other than the websites that send out your information, you can obviously apply to specific airline um, on their portals um, if you want to target a specific airline, which is what I did. Um, I didn't really want to cast a broad net. I had my uh, preferences set. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, you just wait. And then out of the blue, you'll get an email one day and it says, um, you know, hey, Mr. Grandside. Uh, we have gone through your resume, and uh, we'd like to give you an opportunity to take an interview with us. Uh, to which you say, fantastic. Um, and they send you a link. Now, back before 2020, what would happen is you would, sh you would be flown, um, you know, obviously on their dime, uh, you'd be flown out to wherever their headquarters are. For free. You didn't pay for it at all. Yeah, with your... Um, uh, logbook and all your qualifications nice. and then you would uh, uh, sit down with uh, a recruiter pilot probably a station chief pilot and they would and an HR uh, representative and you'd start with uh, a, your usual HR question which funnily enough are the same as uh, when I applied at Home Depot <laughs> uh, bar a few exceptions um, and then you uh, you go for your technical interview where they uh, they kind of uh, check what your um, what your basic knowledge level is. It's not really um, I, w I don't want to say it's, it's an exam. Um, 
what they do is they send you a packet of uh, things that they would like you to prepare mm. that includes things that you won't have been exposed to. You know, for example, uh, like, if I'm a you know a, a prop jockey, I probably don't know mm. a lot about or like, jet like engine. Jepson charts because we're probably used to FAA charts, right? Oh yeah, Jefferson charts are one of them. Um, jet engines, high altitude aerodynamics, mm. so on and so forth. It, at a at a basic level, okay. you know, not you know uh, aeronautical engineering or anything. And then what they want to see is how well you prepare for it, because you're given a very small window of time. And uh, the reason they, this is speculation on my part, but the reason I think they do that is to see how will you cope with 121 training, mm -hmm. uh, which is airline training. Mm -hmm. um, everybody that I've talked to who's on the other end of that says it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. You know, you get a lot of information, very uh, small window of time to learn. So they want to make sure you want to be there. Uh, but that's true for everything in aviation. You you gotta want to be there. It has to be your passion. Mm. Uh, you know the the right reason to get into aviation is because you love flying. Um, don't want to get into it for the money because, like I said, unless right, you're at the right. very peak, there's not a lot of it in there. Right. Um, but you know, at, uh, and you know, absolutely. Uh, some I heard some guys say, "Oh, I chose because it was easier than college." Oh, not really. oh not my really. <laughs> yeah, if you will. So that was the process before. Mm -hmm. Now it's a little bit different. So now um, I've interviewed with uh, a couple. I had my roster. I said, these are the airlines I want to go with. I got lucky enough to go with my number one pick. Mm -hmm. But uh, what they do is they'll send you a link and they'll do a separate technical and HR. And the, um, the technical, uh, sorry, the HR is a recorded interview mm -hmm. with opens itself up to hilarity because you, you get given a flash card where you read the question and you have a certain amount of time to read it and then the your webcam turns on <laughs> and you better know what you're going to answer. Uh, and depending by airline, airline, it could be anywhere between 14 to 20 questions um, just to kind of see what kind of uh, uh, person you are, why you a lot yeah. of a lot of the questions was, for example, who uh, who was the biggest influence in your in your career and why? So you kind of see why are you into aviation. Mm -hmm. um, then that goes through, and uh, one of their uh, airlines HR uh, representative will sit and watch the recording, and um, from there you just kind of sit and pray to, uh, that you get another email. And uh, luckily, I did, where it says, you know, congratulations, you seem like a good fit. And uh, we'd like to schedule a, a technical interview. Here's a list of six or seven, 900 page books that we'd like you to read in the next five days. Oh, and here God. are the available dates. Um, so then you pick a date, and uh, you know, on that day, make sure you're professional, well, you know, clean shaven. Uh, don't be in your shorts and. Uh, yep, you see this? Mm -hmm. Airlines. <laughs> But, uh, you know, don't be in short sleeves with holes on your T-shirt and you just uh, you present yourself like you would at a job interview and uh, you're sat down with a captain. Nice. Uh, and he will start asking you, you know, uh, a lot of the questions, like I said, are probing questions. See, you know, did you read what we sent you? Uh, how well you prepared? And then uh, the new staple of aviation, which is scenario-based questions. So what would you do in this kind of scenario um, question? Which... People that are got in the pipeline after me were probably more uh, uh, prepared to answer because the new training syllabus is mm -hmm. all about scenario based. Mm -hmm. um, That's kind of like how the uh, the check rides are um, uh, now. Well, what, I mean, just from like the pri from the beginning from private pilot check ride. I mean, from my experience, the DPS aren't normally asking what is eight tomato flames, what is ninety one two eleven. No, they give you like scenario based. Would that be the set the similar? Yeah, and it's it used to be that mainly the the DPEs were that way. State checks tended to be more of a rote, uh, you know, what what does this regulation say? Oh. Regulation say? Okay. But now we've switched from what is called the PTS, the um, by training standards, to the ACS, Airman Certification Standards, which um, have put everything into scenario based training. Um, you know, one of the things that used to make me smile is when I would finish a check ride. If it went well, mm -hmm. I would always ask the students, like, so how, how do you think uh, this check ride was? Did you think it was hard? And he goes, it wasn't hard, but 
you made me think a lot. It's like, good, then I'm doing my job. Because I don't want to ask you, you know, name these things off memory. I want right. to see what you would do in that scenario. And it, it lends itself very well to flight training. Mm -hmm. As an examiner, the, the, here's a trick for one of the aviation students is the examiner that comes into your, into your exam only has one question he needs to answer. Mm -hmm. And the trick is figure out what that question is. For example, let's say you're going for your private pot check, right? Mm -hmm. All that guy needs to know is, can this person take an airplane from an FBO and go from A to B without mm -hmm. losing life or his license without me in the cockpit? Right. So prepare yourself to answer that question. You know, make your due diligence for your preps, for your, uh, your um, flight plan and so on and so forth and okay. try and plan for uh, everything that is um, that, that you, you can prepare for because you're never you don't know what you don't know so a mm -hmm. lot of students I see will sit there and I'll ask them a pretty basic question and I can see you know the cogs <laughs> going off in their minds like, what does he want me to answer <laughs> like, that's the wrong way to go just answer what you think I just asked you and if right. it's not what I want to know I'll make the next question more clear to you. I'm not out, you know, none of us are out to get people. Nice. I nice. hope, you know, nice, for nice. the most part. Wow. Well, Jack, thank you so much. You gave us a lot of wealth of information. I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to use this uh, a lot. Uh, the, before we go, though, I want to ask you one last question. Normally, uh, I hear, I, and I hear this throughout my lifetime where I have a, um, uh, more experienced people always come to me and tell me, man, if I already, if I knew what I knew now at your age, man, I would do this different, I would do this different. So based off of your experience of everything you've learned to this day, what would you say to your younger self or those younger pilots that are watching this video now that can probably help them uh, become better pilots and better safer pilots today? Well, <clears throat> it's kind of a loaded question also. <laughs> My instructor tends to be the beginning, right? So I'm not where where you go, oh, back in my day <laughs> when you stuff. Uh, but uh, the thing is, you walk into it with the right mindset. You got to have a 30-70 split in your mind is what, this is actually what my instructor told me. And it made it to where it made flight training for me really easy. I was quite quick through the pipeline because of this. Which mean, what does that mean is, if what you do with your instructor is 30%, percent you got to add another 70% uh, of your own work at home. Uh, your curiosity is what is going to make you a better pilot. So when you learn something and you're like, oh, I wonder where I could use this, don't wait till the next day to go ask your instructor say, where would I use this? You can start asking yourself, start looking for you know uh, stories. There's a plethora of blogs of people you know, sharing their experiences. You know, sooner or later in aviation, you will have an uh-oh moment. You know, actually, we got plenty of those. Um, and take it as a full-time job. Um, especially those guys who decide to go to a 141 school. Mm -hmm. uh, don't just show up for your ground lesson or flight and then go, all right, I'm done for the day, I'm off. Because mm -hmm. uh, th those are the guys that then end up taking forever to pass and get frustrated and kind of tarnish the passion that you have for it. So yeah. let's say, you know, take it, you know, nine to five, what you do as aviation or whatever time you go for your first activity, whether it's five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock, then tack on eight hours. So let's say you do four hours with your instructor, great. Do another four hours of self-study, mm -hmm. surround yourself with people that have your same passion. Uh, that's what I did, you know, I was uh, with two roommates who lived, breathed, and talked aviation, mm -hmm. and um, and just that's the biggest help that you can give yourself is take it on a full time job, even when you're a student. Surround yourself with people that have the same passion, and keep asking questions. Keep asking questions. Don't just don't just take what is given to you and then you're all you're all done. Right, right. So right. That be probably the best advice I can give. Um, other than that, we'll talk in five years, and I'll see if there's anything else. That's <laughs> anything different. All right. <laughs> that I can tell you. All right. Well, again, thanks again. Uh, so this is Jack, uh, airline pilot. Uh, so I'm pretty sure he's going to be flying, maybe flying many of you all. So uh, definitely um, say hello to him if you ever see him in the cockpit. But again, thank you so much.
much for your time. And uh, yeah, good luck up there and uh, stay safe up there. Sure, and you too. All right, man. All right, guys. Uh, as always, I want to keep flying, keep learning, and always have fun. I'll see you guys in the next video, and hopefully I have more uh, interviews ready for you.